Um, so the, the last time we were speaking about Dynamo and giving some of the motivation behind why uh, Amazon decided to abandon, <coughs> excuse me, abandon relational databases and to design its own, what they call the key value store. Um, so they didn't need asset, they didn't need SQL, and your order needed to just give, given a key, for example, a product ID, a customer ID to get back the metadata they needed to populate the web page. And this is a pretty common use case for key value stores. It's sort of like the key is the URL and the value is the data needed to populate that URL. Uh, or for example, in Twitter's case, the key is the, the ID of the user and the value might be, for example, the timeline of that user. Um, so often cases for many uh, websites, major websites that have to manage massive amounts of data, key value store is a simpler uh, option, a much more scalable option and easier to distribute across multiple machines um, and more efficient as well. Um, so uh, in terms of other key value stores, uh, DynamoDB is not that uh, much used in practice, in fact. Uh, so other key value stores include uh, React is quite properly used. Uh, here we see some logos of some companies using it. Uh, Redis, uh, Redis is, I guess, the most popular key value store. Uh, often used for caching, so sort of as a sort of a, an interface for caching the data that's computed for particular uh, web pages, for example. Uh, here we see a list of some websites uh, using Redis to improve their performance. Cassandra. Cassandra started life as a key value store. It's also used by a lot of uh, companies. It's a very popular engine. Uh, it started life as a key value store, but it later converted uh, went in the direction more of a tabular store. So we'll, we'll speak a little bit more about a column family or tabular store. We'll speak more about that second uh, flavor of NoSQL system soon. Um, so actually this is also the system that we will use in the lab today. So we'll be playing with Cassandra. Um, so uh, the second type of flavor of um, NoSQL store that we're gonna talk about, which is a uh, kind of it's more of an enhancement, let's say, on the key value idea is the idea of a tabular or column family store. It has different names. Sometimes they call them white tables, sometimes they call them tabular stores, sometimes they call them column family stores. So this is um, here in the complexity. It's about as scalable and as efficient as key value stores, but it offers uh, some additional features that key value stores don't offer. Uh, so where's key value? Uh, stores offer a distributed map where we have keys and values. Tabular stores are column family stores. We can consider as sort of multi-dimensional maps. In particular, the values are multi-dimensional. So we just can explicitly provide different columns, okay? But we need to still define a key, some form of key for the table, okay? So we still have keys and values. So this is somehow somewhere, somewhere between the key value store uh, idea and a relational database uh, where we have primary keys for our tables. So it's somehow going, it's somehow adapting key value stores to look a bit more like relational databases, we could say. Um, so the main difference here is that we have explicit columns for the values. Um, so a lot of the work that was, that's been done around uh, these, uh, column family stores, these tabular stores, was inspired again by a white paper published by Google uh, describing a system called Bigtable. And this would become uh, the basis for the implementation of, uh, of various tabular stores. So again, uh, we have, you know, some of a common theme, let's say, <clears throat> excuse me, a common theme is that there are certain people who reoccur several times in sort of big data. Um, and in this case, we have some of the same authors of the original MapReduce paper are also authors uh, of this Bigtable paper. So what was Bigtable used for? Um, it was used for Google Earth, for Google Analytics, for essentially managing the kinds of structured data. <coughs> Excuse me, I want to drink something, so. I've been talking too much today. Um, so it's it was used um, in for various scenarios wherever Google needed data, structured data, uh, to manage large amounts of structured data efficiently. 
Um, so for example, Orkut, we all remember Orkut, right? Um, I think this is, I, I can hardly remember myself. I think it was some sort of attempt at a social media, a social uh, media platform by Google before Google Plus. Um, also, for example, for web search to for every web page to to be able to recall the last time it was updated, what uh, website it was, you know, the information about uh, maybe what images you use, what's the snippet that will be generated, and so forth. So there would be inverted indexes, of course, but also some structured data would need to be stored. So for managing structured data uh, in a scalable way. So this was the main use case for Bigtable in the for Google at that time. So essentially, the idea was to have uh, not just key value, but row, column, time, value. So we could say key, column, time, and value. So time used for for versioning. So this is sort of the key here. But as well, we have we can or we should specify the column uh, that we want to to find a particular value and also the time. So there's uh, versioning supported. So here we have an example of, of what this looks like, where we have a key that identifies the row. We have a columns that identify the different kind of values for that key. And we have types. So this is sort of like a 3D table. So it's a little bit hard to represent here, but we see that the population value, we have population value of, of Afghanistan at three, at three different timestamps, T1, T2, T4. So how does this work? We can put in, for example, Afghanistan, the key, the row, uh, the ad identifier for the row, the population value, the column, and the time. And this will give us then the value uh, for that row, that column, and that time. Okay, so intersecting all of these, we see that the, the result we're looking for is here. Uh, 31 million. Okay. So this is the, the basic premise. Um, so the time is sort of not an essential element of column family stores, but the, the column is so that you can specify the key of the of the to identify the row, the name of the column, and then get a value back. And in this case, we also happen to support versioning with the time steps. So another difference to what we saw with DynamoDB is that we actually store uh, the table using sorted keys. Uh, so we don't necessarily hash the keys. Rather, we sort the keys and we use the that sorting to, to define partitions based on uh, key ranges. So this table is sorted and we have the keys in sorted order. Um, any ideas of why it might be useful to have sorted keys versus hashed keys? Or if you remember from relational databases, uh, why you know, B plus trees are better than hash indexes, for example. So B plus trees being sorted indexes over the over a table versus hash indexes, which just hash each element. Um, any ideas? Yeah. So for getting ranges, right? So in this case, we could get ranges, and we could define the keys intelligently, like we've arguably done here, where we have the contents. So we could here also get you know the range of the of the tuples, the, the rows, the data referring to a particular content, content, for example. Or you know, if we just had the plain country names, we could find, you know, quickly find all of the countries that began begin with uh, D or with F. Uh, so we can do range lookups on the keys, which is, is cool. There is a second advantage, uh, which is useful in these sorts of scenarios as well. Uh, aside from range lookups, which is important. So uh, range queries, a second um, uh, importance is this idea of locality of processing. So what this means is that if we define our keys in such a way, we can group data that are often accessed together. We can group them into one partition. So for example, here, if we define our keys in this way, we group all of the data for Asia, we group all of the data for Europe. And this allows a sort of locality of processing. This allows us to kind of cluster, cluster the, the similar kinds of data that we, we might want to access together. Um, so we're clustering here all of the rows for Asia, all of the rows for Europe, all of the rows for each, uh, for each continent. So this isn't maybe the best example because there's what, about 200 sovereign countries. So, you know, it's, 
it's a kind of a bit abstract the example, but a real world example of locality. Um, the benefit of locality for sorting, for example, would be the, the web index that Google would have had. So and Google would still have. So what do I mean by this? Here we're storing some some metadata about the web pages. What's the title? What's the language? You know, how many links does it have, and so forth. Um, so what's interesting is that we've defined the keys in such a way that when we sort this table, we'll group all of the data for a given website, for example, IMDB, into a similar locality of data. And that can be very nice for doing, for aggregating information about a website or for, you know, somehow processing, or maybe, you know, we remove a website from our index, we can just, you know, remove that sort of chunk of data. Um, and the other cool thing, oh, sorry, the other thing I wanted to mention here is ycom.imdb, right? So this is actually, you know, um, Tim Berners Lee did a very good job with uh, the web and everything, but this is really the way it should have been defined. So it should have been the top level domain and then the pay level domain. So you should have inverted it so that, you know, this is the sort of ideal URL, I think. So you go from the most general to the more, more specific. Uh, so why do you do this? So that, for example, org. If we have ace.wikipedia.org, this will now appear as org.wikipedia.ace, which means that it will be grouped together with the other Wikipedia websites. Um, so this is sort of, you know, um, a more it would have been a more sensible way to define uh, web domains. But in any case, uh, you get the idea that you know, writing the URLs like this and then. Uh, sorting, then we group all of the data for a given website, and that can be quite useful because we can sort of process data for a given website uh, within a certain locality. So this is a benefit of sorted indexes. Uh, the range queries is one thing on keys, but also the locality of processing. Now, if we were to split up all of the data, like line by line, row by row, or key by key, when we distribute the data, we would lose that benefit of locality of processing. So rather than do it this way, um, how uh, big table works is it splits by what's called a tablet. And a tablet is essentially just a chunk of uh, sequential records in the table. Um, so it's like a chunk of the table. Like we might have a chunk for Asia or some of Asia. We'll have a chunk for Europe or some of Europe where we'll have some sequential records within each tablet. Um, so this is... Um, uh, we split them essentially by what are called uh, key ranges, which are the, you know, we, we, we know which key ranges are on, on which machine. So a key range, for example, a simple example would be the key range for Asia, okay, or key range of Asia A, all of the keys starting with Asia A, for example, by foreign and tablet. Um, and yeah, so in this way, we can keep some locality of, process, of processing, some locality of our data. Of course, if we have lots of records, it might be split over multiple tablets and multiple machines still. Um, but, you know, um, still we can, we have some extra locality of data that we can process chunks of related data together. So this general idea, we, we've spoken a lot about hash-based hash partitioning. partitioning. This is called horizontal range partitioning. Okay, so range-based partition. Um, any questions? Okay, um, so this is one particular, you know, this was a very seminal, very important white paper. This is just one system that is using uh, the column family tabular sort of uh, paradigm. So what about column families? Sorry, column families denote the idea of grouping um, uh, grouping together columns that are related and that might be accessed together. So for example, you know, let's say for our countries, we might have some information, uh, some political information like um, uh, about the uh, capital, for example. We might have some demographic information about the people. Uh, and so forth. So we can sort of group data or columns that we would like to access together frequently into column families. So this allows more efficiently, for example, to get all of the columns relating to, uh, to the uh, demographic information for the country. Uh, we can put them all into a demographic column family. 
Uh, we can also define access control and storage at the level of the column family. So we could decide that you know the the political information is more important and therefore we'll replicate it more times, uh, whereas the demographic information is you know we can replicate it fewer times, for example. And if the data are of the same type, they can also be compressed more efficiently. So essentially, it allows for storing groups of columns together, separating kind of the it's almost like having two different tables here with the same primary key. Uh, but in this abstraction, and they're combined into one table uh, with the same primary key. So they could be stored separately, compressed separately, they could be configured uh, separately, have different access control and so forth. Um, so this is just one uh, column family um, slash tabular sort of uh, store. There are many and not all of them depend on on uh, horizontal range partitioning. Uh, some of them are based on hash partitioning. So there's a range of different types of uh, designs of, of these systems. <clears throat> but the core idea is to have this sort of key, given a key and a column return uh, a value, or given a key return all of the values for that key. So it's sort of an extension of the key value store. A direct imp implementation of big table uh, became what's called HBase. HBase is still quite used in, quite widely used in practice. Um, it became part of essentially the Hadoop infrastructure. Um, so the idea would be that uh, you know if you need to store and index the results of a Hadoop process, you could do that in HBase. Right? Uh, Cassandra um, later, as I mentioned, it started kind of as a key value store and later became more like a, a tabular store. That's the system we'll use today. Um, and in terms of Cassandra, what is, so since the syntax is very similar to SQL, it's almost like an SQL light. Um, rather than talk through the syntax, which you, you probably will be very familiar to from SQL, we're just going to jump straight into the lab um, so you can get hands on with Cassandra rather than listening to me talk, talk uh, uh, about it. Um, so one thing to mention is that these systems in general based on this abstraction of, you know, searching by key, um, they don't permit as well as joins, they don't permit uh, the sorts of queries you would see in SQL. And we justify that, that that has a cost and the cost is not really justified in, in many cases. So what would happen if you wanted to do a join? So what would happen if you really wanted to join between, you know, do joins uh, across these sorts of tables? The idea is that you don't. You don't do joins um, in the query language. What you do is you rather pre-compute a different table that stores the result of the join you need for your application, and you should do that. You know only if you if you if you really need that join. You know somehow it's going to power your website. You know you're, there's going to be millions of requests. Then the idea is to pre-compute exactly the data you're going to need in each request and store it as a big table. Uh, store it as a uh, in a tabular store. So if you need to do joins, you can't do it in the query language. The idea is you have to use something like Hadoop or Spark to batch process your your joins, and then you can index your data in something like um, in uh, something like Bigtable or HBase or Cassandra. Or same for if you need to do aggregations. If you need to do aggregations, you do them beforehand. In uh, you pre-compute them and then you index them. Um, so, um, yep, that's it. Uh, that's the end of the class. Any questions or, or doubts? So, what does Cassandra does in all of this? Is it a AP system? And so you can set, um, I think the characterization, people do talk about AP systems and CP systems, but I think in practice, the characterization of is something AP or CP, you could say it's more AP or more CP, but what Cassandra allows you to do is to, uh, to provide, provide different settings. So you can uh, provide different settings in terms of the replication factor, in terms of the quorum, uh, how, how the quorum is managed, which actually we're not going to get into in too much detail in this lab. Uh, we're going to see some configuration. So it can be a bit of both, right? And you can actually set, you know, you can have, uh, sorry, higher levels of consensus, 
lower levels of consensus. So, you know, configuring these sorts of details here, you can make something within Cassandra, you can make different uh, tables more or less uh, CP or AP, if you know what I mean. And that's pretty common in NoSQL systems as well, that most NoSQL systems will have these sorts of parameters that you can adjust to make it more CP or AP. So, uh, okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. So, uh, but it's an important, an important question that um, most, you know, it's more of a, a spectrum um, from AT, AP to CP and, and the systems allow configure it, you know, configuring different tables even to, to be more CP or AP. And any other questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, get started on the lab. Um, so I'll stop share here.